have a look on a traditional vowel chart.
Well, <coughs> nowadays we have more modern ways of uh, identifying foul color by using instrumental methods, the methods of acoustic phonetics. Where what we do is actually measure the formants. <coughs> of the bands, the bands where the energy is concentrated in the acoustic spectrum. Well, that basically lies outside the scope of this course. It's part of experimental phonetics. But in fact, if we plot formant 1 versus formant 2 in a particular way, we can arrive at a diagram virtually identical with this diagram, which, of course, constitutes a great justification of what Daniel Jones and other politicians did by ear, we can now do by machine. Part of the problem, though, is that, I say different people have different anatomies, and in particular, adult men, adult women, and children have very different shapes of cavities, and objectively, they produce very different vowel sounds. If, if we measure the formants in uh, Hertz, as we do, Slides per second. You find that the values you get for men are very different from those for women, and both of those are different from what you get for children. And indeed, individuals differ among one another. However, the human ear has a very interesting ability to disregard these differences and to somehow compensate for the differences we get between men, women, and children. This process is known as normalization. And I say it's carried out automatically by the human ear. We don't even think about it, we just do it. Whereas only now are we devising software which can satisfactorily mimic human uh, normalization in automatic speech recognition, where of course it's what has to be done. So again, this vowel diagram, this traditional vowel diagram we use, although in some respects it's not terribly scientific in its foundation because it depends upon subjective human perception, nevertheless uh, has very clear advantages, which is why we continue to use it. Well, the third dimension that we haven't yet touched on is lip position. Now, this is more straightforward in articulatory terms because we can very easily observe the lip position visually. Are the lips rounded, or are they not rounded? If they're not rounded, are they spread? If they are rounded, how tightly are they rounded? Are they also protruded, pushed forward? Well, different vowels in different languages have different possible configurations of the lips. The English vowel or, for example, long vowel in north, thought, law, and so on, has quite firmly rounded lips. Or, 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 or. In fact, of all the English vowels, it's the one that is most reliably rounded. I think it's true to say that in English, we don't make a great use of the lips in different vowels, in distinguishing vowels. When English people observe French people speaking, we are always struck by the energetic use of the lips all the time. <laughs> French has such vowels as you, 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 which require the lips to be really rounded and protruding. In English, we don't bother with that sort of thing. And even with vowels that are traditionally classified as rounded, like the ooh of shoe and moon and so on, the goose, wouldn't say boo to a goose. We don't actually say he wouldn't say boo to a goose. Not normally, we say we say boo to a goose. And you can see that we don't really bother very much with the lips. They are sort of loosely rounded, but not very much. So actually, lip position is not very important in English. Though it's worth paying attention to it more. And Japanese learners who have a mu type of vowel, depending on what part of Japan you come from, your Japanese mu vowel may be very unrounded mu, or somewhat like the English one mu. Some Japanese can usefully <coughs> concentrate on adding a bit of lip around into English. But don't do it. The English semi vowel W is rounded, and that again is something that was important for those Japanese.
Japanese who tend to say, rock, add ground, and you rock, rock, rock. Okay. We put then these three basic dimensions of articulatory power classification. But there are some other dimensions to which we have to pay attention when classifying vowels. Point two on the handout. Vowels can be classified by length, how long they are. Also known as quantity and duration, sometimes with subtle differences of meaning between these three terms. In some languages, vowel length plays no part at all. Vowels are Polish. Vowels of Russian are not distinguished by length. In other languages, length is very sort of simple and straightforward. In Finnish, for example, you have short vowels and you have long vowels, and the long vowels are just like the short vowels, except they last longer. The same is true of Japanese long vowels, not the more vowels. In English, this is complicated by the fact that differences of vowel length in English are mostly accompanied by differences of vowel quality. So we don't have a simple relationship of length, it's a complex relationship involving both length, duration, and quality, timbre. So if we take the pairs quoted on the handout, e and e, u and o, o and o, Ah, nah. You can see that in each case, there's a difference of quality. As well as a difference of length. <coughs> so that if we take a pair of words like Lead, verb to lead, lid, and then cover, can or something. Lead, lid, lead, lid. We've got a difference of duration in as much as this E lasts longer. Lead, lid. But there's also a difference of quality. This is E, which is tensor. E is maxa. And so I also mean that it's nearer to the edge of the vowel chart. There are some other vowels superimposed. There is now the vowel E, the long one. Take it off again. There's E, the short one. You can see there in different places. E, E. And uh, it may often be a useful thing to pay attention to differences of vowel length. There's a third dimension we must look at, point three on the handout, the third type of dimension, um, which concerns whether a vowel is a steady state vowel or whether it changes. We can distinguish between monophthongs, sometimes known as pure vowels, in which the tongue and lips adopt one steady position. And this is contrasted with a diphthong in which they move from one position to another. So English E as in red is a monophthong, E doesn't change, whereas English A as in red a stiff thong because although it starts in much the same position as the air of red, red, the tongue then moves, ray, getting higher in the mouth, closer to the roof, change, a, 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 and it's then we call a diff thong. Uh, notice, by the way, that both monophthongs and diphthongs constitute the center of a single syllable. And this is the difference between a diff thong and a sequence. A sequence of vowels would be in two separate syllables. A diphthong would be in one syllable. So if we take a word like oasis, 
We don't call this a diphthong because it's actually two separate diphthongs, one after the other, one in the first syllable O and then another in the second syllable A. Okay, let's now look specifically at the English vowel system. The difference between monophthong and diphthong is not a theoretically great importance in English. The important difference is that between short vowels on the one hand and long vowels or diphthongs on the other. This is because there are some long vowels that are sometimes pronounced a bit diphthongally, and conversely, there are some diphthongs which are sometimes pronounced more or less monophthongally. I'm sorry that is so complicated, but that's how it is. <coughs> See what I mean? If we take the number three, one, two, three, we think of that as being a long monophthong. And if I were to say one, two, three, then it would be. But three is not actually a very English way of saying that. We say three, three. Can you hear how e, e, it's a bit diphthongal. Now, that's because it's in this rather noticeable position. End of a sentence, carrying the nucleus of the intonation, no surrounding sounds to compete with it. And when that's the case, it often forms a diphthong of the type E, E, E. In other positions in the sentence, it, it might not do so. And in particular, uh, what's my job? Oh, I'm a teacher. Be E in teacher, there really is monophone. There's no time to make it diphthong. So that's what I mean by saying that the difference between diphthong and monophone is not crucial in English because it's uh, not important in distinguishing one phone in English. And the other way around, if we think of the diphthong air as in careful, I did then say it there as a Diphthong, careful, 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 but I might very well have said careful, careful, careful. And I think I used both possibilities in my own speech. The second one, careful, was actually one of them. Air, careful, it doesn't seem to matter very much which one it is. I suppose the English phoneme. All right, back to point four on the handout. We've got the short vowels, which are if, eh, at, uh, of, or. These are the short strong vowels, the ones that can occur in a stressed syllable. Mm -hmm. So a schwa, uh, which is not a strong vowel. There they are, plotted on that diagram that you have there. You can see that they're sort of spaced out, and if you have any problems with distinguishing them, it's probably an adjacent pair. So, depending on your own language background, it may be it versus e, speakers of Arabic, for example, it may be e versus a, Speakers of Polish, for example, it may be A versus A, difficult to speak in Spanish, sometimes Japanese, it may be A versus A, difficult to speak in French, or it might be A versus O, which I think everybody can manage. <laughs> Those are the short vowels. We then got quite a large number of long vowels and diphthongs. I've divided them according to what direction they move in if they move, or where they are if they don't move. So, first of all, those are the ones that go towards the close front area, up here. Long E, diphthongs A, I, OI. Most people, I think, can distinguish all those with no trouble. Then we've got the vowels that go towards, or are at, the close back area. Ooh, not actually fully back in English usually, ooh, but more ooh, the central, getting fronter as time goes on. O, oh, as in coat, go, which moves from O uh, to O. Ow, as in mouth, now, down, which starts open, ow, and goes close. Now there's one further vowel there which may surprise you, which is the sound O. Oh. And this can be regarded as a luxury from the point of those of you who are at a 
fairly elementary stage, but those of you who are very advanced might like to know about it, because this is one of the things that seems to be coming into English, a special variety of O that's used before L, before dark L. So that in a word like goal, in place of the traditional goal, you will find many speakers pronouncing instead something like gold. Goal, goal. And because this is so noticeably different from goal, I thought it was worthwhile possibly goal. This applies before L only, so in words like shoulder, goal, soul, goal. I don't really use it myself. You don't need to use it, but you might like to know. Okay, then we've got another set of vowels, well, the remaining ones really. These are the ones that <coughs> don't get closer, or don't, or are not in the close area. The vowels that are mid or open or move towards some mid or open tendency. Well, we've got the long vowel R, long four, and then these three diphthongs known as centering diphthongs. Centric diphthongs because they go towards the mid symbol. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can see it there, there is also another symbol. That's the er uh, of bird, turn, nurse, and such words. And that vowel really is in the middle of everything. Uh, it's um, also the rest position for native English speakers. Now, in some languages, you seem to have a rest position of the A type. And when you hesitate, you say A, A, A. In English, our rest position is around, uh, and when we hesitate, we go, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so that's what that is. It's also the final tendency of ear, air, and oar. But I've given each of these two slightly different vectors arrows on the chart, because they do have slightly different ending points depending on whether they are followed by a consonant or not. If we take a word like beard, beard, the end point is a little bit closer, beard, 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 compared with beer, that we might drink beer, where it's a little bit open up the beer. So I'm talking about the difference between this closer end point of beer and this opener end point of beer. Again, it's something that, on the whole, looks after itself and is for those who are particularly advanced among people. There are similar pair endings, but air is scarce a bit closer than air fair. Or in those obscure words like good and so on, compared with poor. Which brings us to the topic of or, which is a vowel on its way out in English. That is to say, it's gradually disappearing from English because one by one the words that have or had or are tending to adopt or instead. We'll talk about that more at a later stage. I want to move on now to the important question of vowel duration. Point five on the handout. This concerns vowel length. For the reason English vowel length is pretty complicated as a topic is that, as I say, unfortunately it's bound up in quality. And it's worse than that because, in fact, it also varies a great deal depending on the surrounding sounds. So let's have this definition. A clipped vowel is a vowel that's pronounced more quickly than an unclipped one. And in English, we find vowels clipped when they're followed by one of the 40 consonants, one particular for such a within the same something 
And some people say it's the same word, it's more accurate, they're the same morpheme, and I would claim it's within the same syllable. Anyhow, what does this mean? It means, Roman 1, if we take the word feet, or foot, and compare that with feed, to give food to, you can have a very clear difference of duration. Feet, quite quick. Compare feed. <laughs> when I'm keeping everything else constant. And I don't think I'm exaggerating it very much the difference between feet, feed, feet, feed. Similarly, if we compare loose, not tight, loose, 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 with the verb to lose, lose, lose. Loose ends in a 40 S sound, so you get flipping. Lose ends in a lenis Z sound, so you don't get flipping. And this is actually, perceptually, clearly the most important difference in pairs such as feet, feed, or loose, lose. And it's this, rather than the actual voicing or focus leadism of the consonant, that listeners rely on. Let's take another pair. Rice. Now this ends in a fortis S sound, so you get flipping of I. And it's said quickly, rice, rice, rice. The S itself is rather longer, but the vowel with it from is short. And it's clipping, rice. Compare the verb to rise, and we can now rise, where we have a Venus Z sound at the end, rise. And so no clipping, much longer I, rise. But when you're listening, probably what's easiest to listen out for is the pit. I versus the unclipped I with the criteria training on that. Another example on the handout, rope versus row. So it affects vowels and diphthongs. It's most noticeable, of course, with long vowels and diphthongs, so it does also apply to short vowels. Um, there's a problem of terminology here. Some people call this shortening. Gibson calls it reduction. Both of these terms are unsatisfactory. Shortening would seem to imply that you switch to the corresponding short vowel, but you don't, because feet is still different from fit, like are you fit with the short in. So I don't like to call it short. Everybody except Gibson uses the term reduction to mean changing to schwa or changing to a weak vowel, weakening or they have it as a more general term covering all the things like assimilation and addition that happen in connected speech. So I don't want to call it reduction. And after some discussions in this department, we all decided to agree to call it clipping, and uh, on the whole these terms we well received. So we could call this process pre-fortis clipping, as it happens before a fortis consonant. At least before one in the same syllable. If you've got a different syllable, then you don't know, get it. Let's take the word reap. To reap, the verb to reap, that has dipping because it's got a fortis consonant after it. Reap, reap, reap. The harvesters are going to reap the rewards. Compare the Noun, verb, reprint. The noun is stressed on the reason, it's the best one to take. A reprint, let me get you a reprint. Well, this word has two morphemes, two parts, re and print, and the p is in a different part, a different syllable there, but a different morpheme. The it doesn't exert the tripping influence, so we don't get tripping in that case. Let's look at some more cases where we do get tripping, though. Know? 5, Roman 2, if we compare tent, to sleep in a tent, compared with the verb ten, ten, do you notice that difference? The fortis t at the end of tent causes clipping not only of the vowel, but also of the nasal, and tent, the whole sonorant part, compared with its unclipped person in the one word, 
really is B at the end, 10. Similarly, the word gulp, gulp, causes P, causes clipping both of the R and of the L. So all the sonorants, as well as the vowels, are affected by this. Compare bowl, where the voiced lean is B, exerts no such influence. Five Roman three, this also applies in words of more than one syllable. Listen to the rhythm of paper, 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 paper. Compare labor, labor, labor. Can you hear how the A in paper is said more quickly than the A in labor? <coughs> because the A in paper has the A clipped because of the feel of the words.
going to ask John. I'm going to ask Jeremy. John has one syllable. <coughs> Jeremy has three. So clearly, the R has got to last longer in John than the M does in Jeremy. And that's the rhythm. That looks after itself as long as you concentrate on getting the stressed syllables coming fairly regularly. <coughs> However, it does interact with the pre forties clipping. Now, pre forties clipping, to some extent, can be claimed to be universal in that it's found in all languages, all languages that distinguish voice or voice to voiceless consonants do have something like this put in there. But English magnifies it, makes it more important than its other languages, emphasizes it, it has converted it into a way to recognize the consonantal differences. Uh, as the linguists say, it's been phonologized in English, and so it's particularly important. It's also particularly important, eight on the handout, in these words like teacher. Now, in the case of teacher, we've got an, a double effect of clipping. This is basically a long vowel, e, but it's got a ch after it, and ch is a fortis consonant in Africa. That causes clipping. It's also got another syllable, another vowel, and that causes rhythmic clipping. And the two together interact to make this E really pretty short in duration. Teacher. Teacher. What does she do? Oh, she's a teacher. 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 Notice that she's not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to say teacher. Even though we call this a long vowel. So, just as we saw with voiced and voiceless, that you have to interpret these terms in a somewhat abstract sense, because of the effects of the context, so it is with long and short vowels. You must interpret these in a somewhat abstract sense. It's probably true to say that everything else being equal, long vowels are longer than short vowels, though I have my doubts about that when I compare a word like richer teacher, I'm not sure there's much difference in duration between these two. But other things are not equal, the surrounding sounds are absolutely precise. Yeah? How do you notate the clip We don't really have a satisfactory notation for it. I mean, you could just cut out length marks and uh, or put just a single one in. This is an expression in for the it's very difficult to differ, so indeed, yes, we don't have any satisfactory way of doing it. Uh, partly this is because I'm taking the line that these vowels are all basically long, and my rules make them shorter. Another possible approach is to say they're all basically short, and have rules that lengthen them in the complementary situations. Then you can start adding <laughs> length marks. But basically we're talking here not about phonemes, but about allophones. And to be honest, we would have to make five or six different degrees of length in order to cater adequately for what's going on. And in fact, ultimately, it's not uh, uh, any denumerable number of them because it, the effects are so many and varied and you can speed up and slow down in speech, the intonation comes in and so on. But uh, no, one doesn't want to try. It would be too complicated to try and protect them on that. You have a point, but I think I'm going to say we won't bother you. This word means stopping. How is it pronounced? Ceasing. Like in teacher, the E is doubly clipped. What is S? Another syllable. Ceasing. Ceasing. What happens if you don't do enough for that clipping? Ceasing. Well, it doesn't sound right, but in particular, it's going to start sounding like cheesing. 
grabbing. Now, all right, strictly ceasing has got a voiceless S in the middle, seizing has got a voiceless S, and that is indeed the difference between them. But the rhythmic difference is also important. And if the surroundings are a little bit noisy, you might not hear the difference of voicing, but you will hear the difference of rhythm. Ceasing, 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 ceasing to apply. Ceasing, ceasing, ceasing their accents. Ceasing, ceasing. You would have some more ear training. <laughs> right, last point, uh, just briefly enough, I'm going to come to it later. In my analysis of English vowels, we distinguish between a strong set of English vowels, which are those we've looked at already, and another weak set. Weak vowels are found only in unstressed syllables, in syllables that are never stressed at all. And <clears throat> they are the five vowels listed there on the handout. There are the three of them that we haven't yet discussed. So, first of all, we've got this vowel at the end of happy. Now, we talked about this the other day. It can range within quite a big area. Some, some people have a pretty it-like quality. Indeed, you can't really hear the difference between short it, uh, it, and so on, and the it of happy, 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 happy. Others have something more like an e of three, not so long, happy, happy, happy. Others fluctuate inconsistently between the two possibilities. Quite often you get something that is intermediate. There's a useful German word, Mittelding, here, which we don't have in English, which um, is what you get. There's some intermediate quality between the two possibilities. So that's a rather big blur on the <coughs> vowel chart. Second one is the corresponding back vowel. The, ooh, thank you. Again, you can get people who have something much like it working good. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Others who have something like, much like their ordinary ooh and shoe and so on. Thank you. And people who fluctuate inconsistently, people who produce that little thing and say thank you. From the point of view of the foreign learner, it means that you needn't worry about the E, A, or O, O contrast in these positions. You must worry about it, of course, in stress levels, but it doesn't matter here. Third one is the schwa, which is a bit illegible on this diagram. Covering area, something like that. Uh, this there is not so much by speaker and so on, but according to its position in the word, it actually varies, I think, rather more widely than I've shown it as doing here. In um, final position, better, comma, uh, 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 it tends to be fairly open. In fact, it's not always very different from the art of love and so on. And so a word like summer is not really often very much to hear of a difference, suffer. But notice it isn't quite supper. Supper is supper. This is a little bit closer, even though I say it's difficult to hear. Uh, those of you who are speakers of language like, languages like German and Danish, please note that in English, unlike in those languages, there's no difference depending on whether or not there's a historical R involved. In uh, German, the point is that you make a difference between bitte and bitter. In English, no such difference. English learners of German tend to say bitter for both of those. <laughs> difficult contrast to manage. So don't impose that German difference in English. The other two weak vowels are ones that are also part of the strong vowel system, the it that you get in bucket, and the book that you get in stimulus. Uh, nevertheless, they are part of the weak vowel system, and it's striking that in Australian English, which signifies various things, they cut them out of the weak vowel system, and they use schwa instead and say bucket and stimulus. But we're not teaching you Australian English. <laughs> On that point, we finish for this morning. Thank you. Thank you.